Okay, welcome to our first session of setting up Altium for schematic capture. So, uh, a couple important parts. One, the top right corner is where you will configure your license. So, those of you using home computers, you'll set up your private license server. So, you need to have the following value set up. So, the license server name is LICRVALT, and the server port number is 9780. Again, if you're working off campus on a personal device, you'll need to use the VPN to get access. And then you can use the use button to check out a license. The second thing is in the top right hand corner here, I'm connected to the Camosun College workspace. So this gives me the ability to store documents in and out of uh, version control using the cloud account. So you can see on the left hand side here, I've already created uh, this demo project here. So let's just go through the steps one more time for those of you that might have missed it in the original lecture. So if I go up to File, New, and select Project, I'm going to choose Default PCB Project. And what this does is it automatically adds a schematic sheet and PCB to my document. If I choose Empty, there's nothing in it, and I just get an empty project created. So the very first step you want to do is click here to advance and then choose an appropriate folder. So there's a local folder where it's going to be stored. You, but more importantly, what you need to choose is the folder on the cloud storage. So by clicking the three dots here, it'll bring up the secondary window. The secondary window here is what you'll expand underneath projects here to choose the appropriate folder. Now, if you're working on your actual, uh, printed circuit board for project, you'll use the appropriate project folder for your team. If you're working on it for the ESET 293 class, choose create a folder here in ESET 293. So I'm going to create it under instructor here. And you can see my path here has changed. And let's just call this uh, ESET 293. Demo 2. Now it's important to have proper naming convention since this is a shared online workspace. So let's create that. And then you'll see on the left hand side here, my secondary workspace will be created in a moment, or my secondary project will be created here. And the green check marks on the right hand side show that it's in version control. Now, my number one recommendation is right away, take this document and save it. So right now you can see how I have sheet one in two separate projects. So it can become very confusing if you do not properly um, name these and save them, especially with working in a shared space. So you can see by clicking between these two schematic sheets on the left-hand side, my active window changes. So let's just close this document from the previous one. And I'm gonna save this one, right? So let's just do a quick save as, and what am I gonna call this? Why don't we call this Primary Schematic Demo 2. And there we go. Now it's updated it. And let's just do the same thing with our printed circuit board here. So let's just open up our printed circuit board. And we'll also just save this quickly. Now these names can be changed later, but it's easier if you have some reasonable digital hygiene and name it something meaningful to start with. So let's just call this main demo two. All right, and let's save this to the server. And then this is the act of me actually putting these into version control. So one important thing is this file here where it says PCB project, and this is the project structure. You wanna click this if you're renaming or reorganizing any of these files, otherwise you will not um, push that content to version control. And when your colleagues download it, they won't see the changes to be, for things being renamed or the order of things being changed.
it's always important to add a comment when committing so that you know when you're going through versioning. If you're trying to find a specific version of your file in the future, that you're able to do so and that the uh, file has some meaningful information in it besides just the files that were committed. So there you go. I've now uh, uploaded my files and you can see they're all in version control again. Okay. Now let's take a look at Altium here. So one of the first things you're going to want to do is up in the view tab here, you're going to want to add um, a specific panel and it's going to be the manufacturer part search. So the manufacturer part search gives you the ability to search for parts based on a, a part number. So let's just try something like an LF 411. So these are all the parts that now come back from DigiKey and online part suppliers in order to uh, populate my um, printed circuit board. So if I right click on this, it gives me the ability to place and it, I can also further configure this. I can further filter these results. So if I click this little button in the top left here, I can now spe specify case and packages, um, how it's shipped, the number of pins, all sorts of stuff. Now this is a very powerful tool, but I would recommend for the purposes of working on an actual project, like something that you're doing in your project term, you should take the time to research these parts using a website like DigiKey. So my recommendation would be to go to digikey.ca and actually go through searching through products on this website and find the correct components that you want to use and then use the model, the product number from DigiKey to actually find the uh, appropriate chips that you're looking for. Now, because I'm VPNing into the college, this connection is rather slow. So one other thing that you'll want to look at on the right hand side here is the components window. So the components window right here currently has nothing imported into it because this, the way Altium has changed its software is that all the components that you use should be driven by the workspace you're working in. So because we're working in the Camosun College workspace, you, we would typically use a, a driven library, i.e. Camosun would create a library that you would use for parts, i.e. if this was a business and we were designing circuit boards, the the company would have a known vetted component library that you'd be using. Now, since part of project is you learning the skills and tools to develop that you would use in industry, part of what we want you to do is develop and create your own parts. So for the purpose of this example, I'll show you how to import a library. So on D2L, there's a printed circuit board library that you can add to your project. So I go to the left hand side here and go add existing to project. I can now navigate to where those files are. So I downloaded them and I've already extracted them here to Altium libraries. And then for the first lab that you're going to do, so lab three, we're going to import the schematic and PCB library. And now you can see on the left hand side here, I've added this print circuit board library and I've added this schematic library. But now if you notice over here, they still are not added to my actual available parts lists here. I can't actually drag and drop parts out of them. Um, the easiest way to add it is if I go right click here and I go import library. It's going to actually import this and add it to my component library. So Altium specifically doesn't just import it right away because it's supposed to be a controlled and driven process. It's not just supposed to uh, accidentally put the wrong files in views. Everything should be under strict tight control in order to make sure only the correct components are being modeled with.
So if we take a look at that components tab now, Here are all the components I just imported. So I can now take any of these parts and I can place them on my uh, schematic sheet. So for instance, I can now drag and drop this resistor. So for the first lab on the available um, D12 files, we are creating this circuit board. So let's just quickly go through and start placing some components. So now that I have some components here, so for instance, I can sort these by design item description or a couple other things. We're able to start populating our design. So based on our design here, I need an LM324 op amp and we can see here from the list that I don't have one so let's just do a quick search here and let's see what comes up so I'm going to filter this I want to do this design as a surface mount so we're going to quickly go through here and specify some stuff so that means that I'm going to want why don't we just say an SOIC package or a TSOP since both those are common um, through whole parts. And by the looks of it here, there's quite a number of them available. Um, I'm going to want uh, rail and tube, cut tape, or bulk. These are just low cost ways of getting the parts actually shipped to you. And I'm gonna want a 14 pin package. So if we actually look at the document here, for my main part, this LM324, I have a U1A, a U1B, a U1C, and a U1D. This last designator here, the letter A, B, C, and D, means that there's four parts that all belong to the same chip. So that means when I place this chip, I want a 14 pin part because that means I'm going to have four separate parts in it. Now let's look at our options here. So the coloring on these tells you whether or not they're available. So we're going to want a part um, that's in green because uh, that means that it's available. So that one's still low stock. All right, let's see if we can filter this a little bit further. Well, we'll use this part despite it having a low stock count. So you notice when I go to place my first part, it already has the UNA designator. Now when I go to place my second part, it has the B, the C, and the D. So these are the th four parts that are contained within my chip. And just before I cleared the last part away, you saw that it came up with A again because it understands that there's four parts here. Now, let's say, for instance, I accidentally only placed one part. So I could still copy and paste this. So let's just delete part B here for a second. So let's say I accidentally only placed one part and I wanted to continue placing the rest of them. Well, now this isn't going to work because the pin numbers don't match. However, I can still click on this part. And on the right-hand side here, I can go over to Properties. And you see here where it says Part A. If I unlock this, I can now switch this from part A to part B, and now the pins change appropriately, but you're gonna be sure to wanna lock that as soon as you're done. So there you go. I have my layout here set up, and we're on our way to getting uh, this circuit wired. Now, I need a number of resistors in between all these parts. 
So for now, I can just use this generic symbol, but in general, what you would want to do is you'd want to go out and specifically choose all your resistors. So you'd want to go to say DigiKey and then find all the exact resistors you would going, you're going to use for your particular project and then store those in uh, an Excel document so you could quickly search for them in this part search list and then add them to your document. The reason being is that it then includes the data sheet for the part, links to all the, the manufacturers for sourcing them, and will give you real-time pricing for your bill of materials. So we're going to need a few more components if we're going to be wiring the rest of this board. So let's start adding some of the resistors in. So I can either copy this existing resistor here in my design, or I can grab it from the components menu here. So why don't we just grab another resistor from here? So I grabbed res one before. So let's just do that again. So I can start placing these uh, roughly in the locations I'm going to need them. We can always modify this later. And if I need to rotate a part, the space bar is what gives me the ability to rotate. Okay, so those are the five resistors I need for the design. And we also need one, two, three capacitors. So we have uh, one of them that is polarized. So again, the curved bar on a capacitor means it's the negative side. This particular one also has a positive arrow showing on it. And my last capacitor here is also uh, positive or polarized. So I also need an LM7805 voltage regulator. So again, I don't have that in my parts list here. So let's just go and do a manufacturer parts search. Okay, so here's our parts here. So we're well on our way to doing our design. I still need uh, an input port though. I still need some type of jack. So from our data sheet or from our schematic for the lab, we can see that the input is uh, a CP-202A. Let's try eliminating the dash. CP-202A-ND. So there we go, there's a power jack right there. So we're gonna add this to, see now the issue we have is there's no model. If you look down here, there's no actual symbol for this part currently. So for right now, for the purpose of this, let's just use a generic header. And then I can update that part sure we'll use this header right now to represent our input 
we'll change this. So we need only three inputs for our connection. So pin one in, in our actual schematic here is ground. Uh, so this is showing a barrel and tube connection. Uh, we'll modify this in the future so it better represents it. But essentially all we need now is a 2N5485 for the output stage here and then uh, two LN265 and an LN365 diode. So let's add those last couple parts and get this wired up. So again, we don't have those parts available in here. So let's just do a quick manufacturing part search. So again, none of these have a model, which is unfortunate in this situation here. We don't have a model for one of these chips, which is not going to be able to allow us to place it. And let's see if we can grab the one of the diodes instead then. And also we don't have an LED available for us for this. So let's just try a generic search for, let's just see if we can get a red LED. And we'll specify a through hole LED. So has model means we'll actually have a model from it that we can actually use. And let's just go through hole. Sure, 67 cents each. That's kind of an ugly symbol. Let's get something a little bit better than that. There we go. So this is gonna be on the output for our high side. And then we also need a green one. So let's see if the LN365 is available. Ah, we've come this far. Let's just switch it from red to green. So here's our two uh, LEDs, and we need a transistor for output here. Now, since I wasn't able to grab one, this N-channel MOSFET should do for now as a placeholder for us. Okay, so that's the majority of our parts, so we can actually start wiring this now. So I need a couple other things. I need to provide power and ground still. So remember when we're placing these ports, Altium doesn't actually know what power and ground is. So in general, for your design, 
you'll need to specify how that's actually physically connecting to your board. In this case, we're going to be going through this header jack here, this power jack. And we're going to be making a link. So we're going to have our 9 volt source coming in here. And we're going to have a 5 volt source. Pads up there. So I'm going to switch my source up here from ground to VCC. So I'm going to place a plus 5 volt port here because that's going to be what our output stage is connected to. And then if I connect those ports elsewhere on my diagram, Altium will automatically know that these are all connected. They're all physically connected to one another. So let's start doing some wiring here. So we're going to use the uh, place wire tool here at the top. And let's start with our stage here. So you can be a little messy with the schematic wiring because it's pretty easy to move the parts around after the fact because all the wires stay linked to one another. And all I'm doing is I'm just recreating the drawing that was provided to us. So my 5-4 part connects here. So here I didn't actually get a junction. So if you don't actually see that dot or you actually don't see the lines touch, um, it's not actually connected. So I can see from that dot that that's actually a junction connection. So if I hold shift and scroll, I can go side to side scrolling in Altium. You don't always have to pan. So my apologies. So this wire here, I actually need to change based on the diagram. Let's just, I made a couple of wiring mistakes here. So let's just delete some of these lines quickly. So nine and five are connected and then this is connected to ground and 10 connects up here. And then our output from here goes to the diode. This goes to three. So the difficulty I had placing my parts because I didn't have my library properly configured is why I strongly suggest before you start getting into doing schematic capture that you start trying to think about uh, what parts you're going to be using in your design because um, it can take quite a bit of time to get a proper library set up with proper components. So my last um, unused chip here, we always want to ground to make sure that it's in a known state. So the last thing I need to do is I need to put, so we ground the inputs, we can't control the output. So the last thing I need to do is I need to uh, place a directive. So I need to place a generic no ERC. So that means generic no electrical rule check is what ERC stands for. And then 11 here is, so four and 11, are the um, power and ground pins for the op amp. So because it's a shared part, four and 11 is the same pin set for all of these different parts in it. So I only need to connect one of them. And if I wanted to, I can actually set this up through the properties window here. 
and I could hide pins 4 and 11 on the other uh, packages. So for instance, there they're now hidden. So we can go into more detail about how this part's created and how to hide them. But for now, just know that it can be customized. Okay, so that's my basic design. It's more or less what we have in the lab document other than it's a little bit messy. So let's do a little bit of cleaning up here. So if I might drag and drop a box. So if I select something I don't want, If I hold shift and click on it, I can remove it. I can also add something in by shifting and clicking. So, and then I can also add another selection box here. So let's just drag this down over here and let's just straighten this out a little bit. So you can see here that I've missed the connection on this pin. So the easiest way to, is to take this cap and move it down. And I can just move this wire so slightly. And now let's just make that connection. There we go, so that cap's connected. We'll do the same thing here. We'll move this cap down. We'll move that part up. And I can also do a few things, like I can highlight all these ground pins here. And if I go up to the edit window on the top left, I can align my parts. So in this case here, what am I gonna wanna do? Well, I'm going to wanna align the vertical centers. Um, so if I don't choose one, it's just going to choose the center of all the objects that are selected. I can also choose um, to align based on a particular um, uh, alignment, like align to top, align to bottom, basically the highest part, the lowest part. So let's just grab all these parts here. So I'm going to grab this one and this one and this one and this one. And let's just go edit, align, and we'll go align to bottom. And now they're all aligned, but notice when I did that, it actually breaks the wires. So just be wary of that, that uh, if they actually move too far, you will actually have to reconnect them. So there you go. Those are now all nicely aligned. And let's clean up a little bit of the rest of this wiring here. So let's just move this down a little bit. And same thing, I can align these uh, in a vertical line as well. So I can choose align uh, vertical centers. Oops, I mean align horizontal centers. But again, generally when you're selecting wires and things like that, you kind of get a little bit of nastiness there. So it's best to align them before you route it. But there we go, that's looking a lot better. Oh, and I'm missing a ground connection here. So let's just add that in. You can change the snap grid in the program as well, so that like a little alignment issue there also disappears. Uh, and why don't we move this so the wire is not bisecting the resistor?
Sometimes you have little weird wiring artifacts like that, so it's easier to sometimes just delete it and redo it. And again, escape key um, generally gets rid of any of the tools that you're using. So there we go. There's essentially our design, right? So we, if we look back at this, these two are essentially the same thing now. A couple different parts that we'd need to clean up. I also need to change these values here. So if I want to change the values, um, we have a tool here for doing parameter management. So I can select what I want to see. So in this case, I want to see parts, nets, models, and uh, documents. You can ch change these. So let's just see what that looks like. So now these are all the the values that just popped up or all the parts that just popped up. So you can see some of them have a lot of information. Some of them have not that much. For instance, if I'm looking at um, my resistors, say I want to change all my resistor values here. I can change them all in bulk using uh, this tool. But for the purposes of this, I can also just click on them one at a time, or I can click on the value here and edit it. So in this case here, so my first resistor there should be 4.7 meg. So if I just double click on the parts, I can change the value. So this one's one supposed to be 1.5 meg. Now let's see what we happens in that parameter manager. If I say I only want parts, no nets, no models, no documents, um, and not to exclude system parameters. So now I only have parts that are in my document. And you can see here that this comment is actually my value. So if I knew what these were, so the issue is right now is because I haven't annotated these, I don't know what resistor belongs to what part. So let's annotate this. Annotation is changing this R question mark to an R value. Basically, you're giving the parts um, a nuanced name that's unique. So up to um, tools here under annotation, you want to choose annotate schematic, and then you can choose how it's done, i.e. what's the order that it does the annotation. And in here it gives you a graphical representation. So let's do across then down. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to update my change list because Altium is um, engineering focused. So it wants to show you what the changes are going to be before they're done. So we'll validate, then we'll execute. And I'm going to accept and close. And you can see here, all my values have now been updated, right? I now have labels for each one of these. Okay, now let's take a look at the parameter manager again. So I can now see here what values, right? Because I have my identifier here. and then I have my value. So in this case, I have R2 and R3, those are the correct value. So this value in the top right, according to my document, should be 100K, okay, so that one's good. Uh, this value should be 68K, so R4. Let's change that to 68K. And then R5 is the value just below it. So let's change that to 33K as in our document. Okay, so now all my resistor values are set. And again, I'm gonna to have to make a engineer change list. We'll validate the changes, we'll change them. And there we go. There's essentially my design ready to go. The only other two things that I have to change are these two capacitors. So this capacitor here, according to our design, is 10 microfarads. Now again, 
I would need to specifically find the appropriate cap with this value. And I would search for that using the manufacturer part search rather than just typing this in. So for instance, in our design, it says 10 microfarads and 25 volts. So let's see if our old PAL DigiKey is playing along better. So we're gonna go underneath um, products. There we go, that's a little bit better. And we're going to look under capacitors. Now specifically, I know this is going to have to be an uh, electrolytic or polymer capacitor because it's 10 microfarads. It's pretty hard to find, um, it could also be tantalum, but they're expensive. It's pretty hard to find ceramic capacitors in that size. So let's go aluminum electrolytic capacitors. And according to our design sheet in the lab, I need 10 microfarad, 25 volts, and it's polarized. Another key factor to know that this is probably an electrolytic cap is that it's polarized. So I'm gonna come down here to my menu. I'm gonna say 10 microfarads. And I'm gonna choose 25 volts or higher. So I'll just select all the ones that are higher as well. Let's say in stock, normally stocking, we're gonna say apply. And let's take a look at here. So let's just sort these by price. So this one here is very cheap, but I have to buy 2000 of them. This one here is only 14 cents, but it's through hole. The other thing you want to take into consideration is the temperature range on them. Uh, a higher temperature range will make a capacitor last much longer. So because this has a slightly stronger spec, i.e. a higher temperature range for the same amount of hours with a higher voltage tolerance, why don't we go with this one? We have a lot here in stock. So I can just grab this part number here. Let's go back to our friend uh, Altium and let's just do a quick search. And there we go. So there's my part there. So we'll just wire this up instead. Now there's also an option to replace parts, but sometimes it's easier just to manually do the change. Okay, so now you can see that this isn't annotated either. Well, other than doing the, the full on engineering change, I can also come into this menu here and I can also do annotate schematics quietly, which basically just means it's just going to just do it and it's not gonna do the big prompt with the window. So now this is a proper part um, that's uh, sourced off DigiKey. And why don't we just do the same thing for other two caps here? So our output cap here is 0.33 microfarads, and we have a five foot, a five volt output here. So let's find a cap on DigiKey. That gives us a five volt output. So again, I'm just going to uh, get rid of our capacitance value here. I'm gonna change it to uh, 0.33 microfarads. Uh, so my filter here was overly restrictive. So let's just get a wider voltage range on that. Oops. just remove all we'll just start from scratch sometimes it's easier just to do the legwork so we're going to do 0.33 microfarads we're going to want it in stock and normally stocking basically that just means they have it on hand oh and they only have one result for 0.33 microfarads well why don't we make these two ceramic caps then since they're small enough that they could be, and they don't necessarily have to be polarized. So we'll just choose microfarads out of the drop down menu. 
uh, why don't we just say 0 0.1 to 1 since um, we need to find two caps anyways and they need to be at least uh, 5 volt rated so I'd say go at least double so 10 volts would be the bare minimum but like, why don't we just go 25 volts and higher so we'll just select a wide range there and I can also select packaging so uh, bulk bag cut tape um, tray and tube are all um, small ways to get uh, parts where you don't buy a whole reel worth and let's take a look here let's just do a quick sort by price so about 14 cents each is the cheapest so here we have a point one it's this is 55 to 85 and this one here is 55 to 125 now keep in mind depending on the type of project you're doing um, you're gonna have to pay attention to the type of temperature dielectric it's using so these X7Rs are okay for generic uh, part use, but if you're doing anything audio related, you're going to have to look at the capacitor selection chart. You're gonna need a type one dielectric instead of a type two. Now, the other thing to note here is these are very small surface mount parts. So let's make sure that we're not gonna get a part that's too small. So let's go over here to the package case size. So we're gonna choose parts that are 0603 or larger. I'd say 0805 or larger is actually better. So let's just do 805 or larger uh, down to here. Apply. 0.1 microfarads, 50 volt X7R. Still only 14 cents. We have an 0805 part. Looks cheap and cheerful to me. Let's go for it. Plenty in stock. So this will be our part uh, to replace C1 up here. No model for that one, unfortunately. So in this case, let's go back to DigiKey. And let's try our second friend here to see if the Samsung one comes up as a part head. There we go. So there's no model for this one. So what you'd end up doing is you'd take this information and you'd add it to your part. So for this one here, why don't we just change this to uh, 0 0.1 microfarads. And for this one here, we'll change it to our 0 0.33 microfarads. Now I need to add in the actual part number for this and the appropriate footprint to match. So if we actually look at the properties for this, um, there's no, f uh, the footprint currently for it says no model. So we'd have to add a footprint to this before we could actually bring it to our printed circuit board. So I'm happy with my document. Let's save it and we're gonna commit it back to the server. So I can also in Altium um, under the view panel here, if I go to panels and if I go to task list, um, oh, never mind. Comments and tasks. So I can place comments. So for instance, I can assign this task to me or I can assign it to someone else in my group. And why don't we just put a couple other comments in here.
Okay. So if you notice, I didn't actually change the schematic at all. Adding those comments automatically gets posted into the version control cloud. So I'm essentially done my schematic capture now. I've captured also all the important information in terms of uh, the parts that still need to be found. I should also add one final note, and that's for all my resistors. All my resistors need to be appropriately found as well. So there we go. I have my nice little to-do list here. So I can come through and I can check these off one at a time so I don't miss any information. And let's just take a look right now if we wanted to move forward with this and actually do our printed circuit board. So if I went to actually do my printed circuit board here, see how it's saying errors during compilation of this project, click here to view them before continuing. Essentially what this is going to tell me is that parts of my project are not gonna be able to be moved uh, because I'm missing footprints. So let's just do validate changes and let's do execute changes. And there we go. Here are my parts now on my printed circuit board. So this little red box here is the room that all the parts are given. So I could now start going about and then physically placing these parts. So in general, you don't need the room. Um, so let's just get rid of it. But basically now I'm ready to start placing parts and I now have my relation between how, how all these parts work. Hopefully that was informative and that this helped you further your printed circuit board journey. Tune in next time for a tutorial on printed circuit board design and best practices.